Bonjour à toutes et à tous et bienvenue dans le reportage du Tour des Possibles. Caméra à la main, nous avons passé six mois autour du monde à la recherche de projets citoyens et low-tech liés à l'énergie. Des biodigesteurs en Inde, aux maisons off-grid en Australie, en passant par les fours solaires de Costa Rica, tous les projets que nous avons trouvés ont la particularité d'être à petite échelle, d'avoir été initiés par des particuliers et d'avoir un impact positif sur l'environnement. Nous vous présentons aujourd'hui ces différentes bonnes idées mises en œuvre aux quatre coins du monde qui permettent d'améliorer la consommation énergétique de sa maison ou de son quartier. C'est parti Let's start our journey by going to Australia, in Castle, Maine, a suburb of Melbourne. There lives Joel Meadows, an avid handyman, father of two, who decided to build quite an original house. Joel's house will structure this video since it gathers many simple and innovative principles that we'll detail later, and that will be illustrated by other projects that we found during the trip. Built from local and ecological materials, the house is completely self-sufficient in water and has energy needs of less than 3 kilowatt hours per day. That's to say, 10 times less than the equivalent household needs in France. All this while maintaining a comfortable temperature inside. Uh, the temperature differentials are quite extreme. Mm -hmm. So we get hot summers up to 45 degrees in, in, the, in the most extreme. But we also then have to deal with our, our winters, which, yeah. And usually we don't go, it'll go below freezing, maybe five below. It's, it's a pretty big rain. And above all, it has been completely designed and built by Joel and his wife. Yeah, we did pretty much everything. And I've designed all of it so that it's as fixable as possible. So all of the, all the technologies we've tried to engage to the, for the most part are around stuff that we can repair ourselves or we can repair within our local community. Um, and that's been one of the, the principles we've tried to stick with rather than going really high tech. A real challenge which took two years of work and many innovative tricks, which enabled Joel to construct a highly energy efficient house. Let's start with the first distinctive feature of the house, a large greenhouse. This concept is found in earth chips, these original houses that we saw an example of in Adelaide. Hey guys. Earth chips are houses that are 100% self-sufficient, built from recycled materials. Numerous earth chips have been built all around the world. The large greenhouse, here north facing since we're in the southern hemisphere, catches the maximum sunlight throughout the day. Behind the glazing one can find plants, the sitting room, and a wall with high thermal inertia. This wall at the back of the room stores the heat during the day and returns it during the night. Fundamentally the north facing double glazing on the greenhouse. This greenhouse is for providing warmth to the living spaces, but it's also here for um, uh, cooling as well, surprisingly, so by opening the, um, I can just um, use this pole to open and close that skylight up there. See one of the skylights is open and uh, that's an important part of the um, passive cooling and heating system, which is what you see here is the inlet um, to the earth tubes, which are um, just plastic pipes about 10 inches in diameter that um, just gradually slope up to a little, like tiny little cellar. So there's a little, a little cupboard here that I use to regulate the airflow through the earth tubes. So I can stop the airflow or increase the airflow and the air comes through this little grill here. Um, when there's hot air in the greenhouse and you open that skylight, the hot air rises up out of there and as long as all the doors are closed on the earth ship mm -hmm. that forces air through those tubes just by natural convection um, and as the air passes through those tubes it changes temperature so in the summer it cools down and in the winter it warms up because of the stable temperature of the earth at two meters depth but this large greenhouse principle hardly fits in cold countries, as we found out in Mongolia, in this earth ship. As Mongolian winters are vigorous, and due to the poor thermal insulation properties of glass, the house requires a heating system. Nevertheless, we found a house near Moscow in which windows account for 40% of the house's external surface. Their solution? 
polycarbonate window panes. This type of plastic has the advantage of having a much better thermal resistance than glass while being cheaper. Its frosted surface provides privacy. As for the Earthship, the ventilation has been well thought out. La circulation de l'air euh, est idéal. The house has very few walls inside, including between the floors, which creates a draft to circulate air throughout the house. We go back to Australia, to Joel's, to focus on the principal element, building materials of the house. So, yeah, so the house has been designed to, to try and maximise the available resources here in Castlemaine. The other thing that we were trying to do as much as possible was use easily locally available material, so lots of, the, lots of them around. We're in a wheat area, and this is a, a classic one that happens in natural building too, where people get they get hooked on a, on a system mm -hmm. that isn't necessarily the best for their place. So you hear of people doing straw bale and doing it in areas where there's no, you know, grains grown in their area and they have to truck the bales ridiculous distances yeah, yeah. and you just go, no, there's, <laughs> there's, there's, lots, no, there's lots of materials around. So it was for us that being in a wheat growing area made it an easy decision. So the, the, the main building material for the walls that we've used is, um, is straw bale. So these walls here are uh, straw bale walls. So that's just, um, and that was grown locally by a local farmer. And apart from this, this white clay on the inside, which we've used instead of a, a paint, all of the outside and all of the build-up coats underneath this are from the clay that we dug for the site. So the foundation okay. works that were dug from here are the clay that we then coated the house with. So it was the, the materials were very available to us, which was and that means that any work that we need to do with maintaining the house comes from the soil. We can just we can dig up the material that then repairs the house, which is which is nice. But in order to better understand how these walls are built and discover other building techniques, let's go to South America. Nous voilà arrivés à Organismo au nord de Bogota en Colombie, un centre qui a développé différentes techniques de bioconstruction. This center serves as a place for experimentation and demonstration with many different techniques. Most materials are collected on site, such as clay. The clay is very great for construction. It is also used to do adobe, a kind of cob. Okay. Adobe is the mix of 40% uh, sand, 40% mm -hmm. uh, clay, and 20% shit cow, horse shit, and straw, uh, water. The um, the cheat horse is very good for the fibers, the mm -hmm. the fibers, yes. uh, and the cheat coat is very good for the waterproof. Follows a session of practical work. When the mixing is done, bricks are handmade in a mold. They have to dry between 8 to 10 days before they are ready. When a higher resistance is needed, one can compress the bricks using a machine and add small pebbles to the mixture. Another technique commonly used is that of the super adobe, also called earth bags. The idea is to fill a bag with a mixture of adobe, which is very malleable before it dries. We can then give these bags a very rounded shape, which are characteristic of many bioconstructions. At the end, one can add a coating on top to have a much smoother appearance. Necessary use 20% of cement, really, okay. because it's too bigger, then it's necessary. For the other, the small, you don't need to uh, use uh, cement. The other technique is the uh, house of bottles. This technique is widely used in earthships, including in the one we saw earlier. In addition to recycling old bottles, it gives a certain cachet to the building. It just um, yeah reduces the amount of cement and sand you need to build this. It's sort of like a little spacer. Um, they're non-structural. Like all the all the forces going through here just sort of go through all the um, the cement mortar. And you just kind of roll the bottle through the the diamond blade, 
cut the neck off the bottle and then we just use some duct tape to tape the two two bottoms together and then all the all the waste glass all the necks of the bottles we just smash that up and put it into the floor here to carry on with local and natural building materials we must get to brazil we then leave colombia for three days to go down the amazon river by boat to reach Nova Friburgo in the north of Rio. That is where we find Pindorama, a centre specialised in bamboo construction. The main reason people come here is to learn how to build with bamboo. So we have many like bamboo buildings. And... All the bamboo that is used here is either locally grown or comes from the region. Once cut, it must be treated so that the bamboo remains resistant against insects, mould and fungi. First we cut it, then we put here in this uh, tank. Okay. And the solution is 1%. Half percent of copper, half percent of uh, a, a botic. One week, so that the bamboo can... Absorb it? Absorb it, yeah. But one detail intrigued us. What are all the holes in this bamboo? If you don't make the holes, when it's hot, it uh, gets the dilatation mm -hmm. and when it's cold it gets smaller so if there is no hole the bamboo cracks but there seems to be another explanation for this as we found out at Tiberio, another center specialized in bioconstruction and located a few kilometers away pieces that we like to work with 13 meters and so forth it would, be an ev it would be very difficult to make a tank that long. It's nice for three meters, four meters poles, but mm -hmm. these long ones, we have another system where we in gently incline them on a slope, and then we perforate the centers all the way down with a metal rod and leave the last diaphragm closed, and then we fill them up with the liquid from the inside. From the inside. Finally, let's meet the last bamboo building enthusiast in Colombia, back to Bogota, in the heart of the city. Located here is Fonsena, a centre that has built a three-storey green wall made entirely of guadua, a tree of the bamboo family. Hello, Paul. Oh. Hi. Hi, Thibault. Hello. Guadua have a lot of ben a lot of benefits. Strong material, natural material uh, to construction. It grows very quickly. In three, five years, you can have a, a big field full of guadua. Guadua is a very cheap material uh, that can reduce cost in a built uh, project or maybe can reduce time too because it's very flexible and you can cut it and immediately install. And other benefits related with guadua is, is a very longer material, is an everlasting material. Last advantage, the flexibility of bamboo gives the structure a great resistance to earthquakes. Here we have a piece of guadua. Guadua have uh, different sections. And this material works very well to resist weight when you use with the technique, with this technique that is called uh, fish mouth. Yes? Fish mouth permit or asset that you can put the structure here, see, yes, close to the newt. Then one needs to punch a hole and hold using screws. One can also notice another technique using small bamboo nails, but this has less resistance for larger structures. Bio architecture really is you know, related closely to the conditions of the local climate. Let's go back to Joel Meadows' house, which has another important feature. It is totally autonomous in water, thanks to a rainwater recovery system and large tanks. 
number. So we've got about 40,000 litres of, of water in storage here. And actually after the rain last week, we have 40,000 litres of storage, which is great. Uh, <laughs> coming into summer, we always appreciate those, um, those late uh, spring rains or early summer rains. To be able to use water at the tap, all that remains is to find a way to have pressure. Up the very top is the, the water tank, so that's cold water header tank. And what we do is, um, these tanks are connected underground by pipe, mm -hmm. and there's a very tiny little 12 volt pump down the bottom of the tower. And that is connected to a very little solar panel up on the, up on the tower and that pumps the water up to the header tank and that's got a little float switch and when it gets full, it turns it off. You know, it'll be off for several days and then it will, you'll hear it kick back on again and, and fill up the tank. But it means every time we turn on a tap, it's gravity doing the work, which is actually a renewable resource. The recovered water is directly used without being filtered. Nevertheless, Joel built a system that guarantees the quality of the water. And it's got a little divider in it with a hole in the middle and a floating ball. And when the ball comes up and touches that, then the water overflows into the tank, which means the first, on each yes. side, the first 35 litres of water with the dust and the bird poo and that, all of that goes into here. And then we can just drain that out and water the garden with that stuff because we don't mind the extra nutrient, but we don't want the nutrient and the sediment in the tank. So I need to empty this before the next rain. That's called a first flush diverter. You can see this one I've made. But if one wants to make sure of the quality of the water, a filter can be used, as we saw in the 100% autonomous house of Heath Hansen. It is located on the main island of Hawaii, at the edge of the ocean. The rainwater is collected on the roof and is stored in a 34,000 litre tank, and is then filtered before being used in the house. So it comes up here, and it goes into this cast iron shallow well pump. The shallow well pump, when it is running, it, it draws about a kilowatt and a half of energy for about two minutes. So uh, basically the pump pressurizes this tank and this tank constantly maintains a pressure between 30 and 50 PSI. So we use the taps and they're always very high pressure in the house. The water comes up and it goes through these two filters that are mounted on the side of the house here and they have one of these in them. And this, the first stage of filter is just simply a, a string a wound filter and then it goes to the next filter which is a really cool, um, it is coconut husks. And then on the back there you'll see that long silver tube yeah. and that is a, by, made by a company called Sterilite and that is a UV light. So you can drink straight from the tap in the house and it's just the rainwater, no chemicals added. But not only isolated houses can collect rainwater. For example, Fontana, that we visited earlier, in the heart of the Colombian capital, recovers rainwater on its roof by these grids to water the plants of the green wall. We have now studied water consumption. Let's move on to electricity. Joel Meadows chose not to install solar panels, but focus on energy savings. We haven't focused on, on photovoltaic. However, photovoltaic panels can be very efficient as we saw in Hawaii. Peace House is 100% autonomous thanks to 18 300 watt panels. And in some cases, photovoltaic can be the only viable solution to have electricity. For this, we have to go to the other side of the planet, to Mongolia. In Mongolia, a large part of the population is still comprised of nomadic families, who change their location up to four times a year. Most of the time, they settle in the middle of the vast desert steppes, which makes it difficult to be connected to the electricity network. Nevertheless, the majority of yurts are equipped with a light bulb and a TV set. We are arrived in the desert of Gobi, in the south of Mongolia, in a small family nomad who lives totally in autonomy. The Mongolian steppe is very sunny, about twice as much as in France, so the solar energy is a great solution to have electricity. Most of the time, a yurt has solar panels of 100 to 150 watts, connected to a 12 volt battery and to an AC-DC converter and a charge regulator. This system produces about 500 kilowatt hours per day. Les deux panneaux solaires extérieurs permettent d'alimenter ces deux batteries, qui permettent à leur tour d'alimenter la télévision de charger les téléphones portables et ils ont également la lumière le soir. The investment of around 750 euros is expensive for the country, 
but most Mongols, sometimes supported by government funding, make this purchase, which drastically changes their lifestyle. Direction aux Afghan Mandal, à l'ouest de la Mongolie. At another scale, several people ask for the construction of a field of 900 solar panels, accounting for the total power of 150 kilowatts, enough to provide electricity for the 2,000 inhabitants of the village. The drawback of such a system is that it uses batteries, which have to be changed regularly and which pollute a lot. We stay in Mongolia for another important feature in the house, especially in this country, the heating system. We discovered in Ulaanbaatar low-tech systems enabling you to heat up a room for a few dollars and a bit of DIY. Nous allons maintenant rencontrer Freud qui va nous expliquer le fonctionnement de son chauffage solaire. The solar heater consists of a box that we put against a window. This box is composed of a transparent plastic which lets the sunlight through, followed by a black and opaque plastic. This plastic will absorb solar energy and heat up the air inside the box. A ventilator circulates the air located between the black plastic and the back of the box and sends it to the room. The air intake is through the openings at the bottom of the box. The output is at the top through a fan, either mains powered or using solar panel. The thermostat triggers the fan only when the air in the box is hot enough. When using a solar panel, it will only trigger the fan when it's sunny. These heaters, usually they go up to between 12 and 14 degrees. It goes in with 4, comes out with 16. It's kind of always the same. So if you put 10 in, you get 20 out. All that for a very moderate price. $15? Yeah, it's already... The expensive. thermostat is uh, the most expensive thing. That's $6. The ventilator is uh, $3, $4. We have plastic panel. Oh, no. Nothing. Nothing. The system must then be put against a window. In bright sunshine, the system corresponds to a heating of an estimated 350 watts. Fruit also found a low-tech system to renew the air in his workshop without losing heat. By manufacturing his own exchanger, his principle is well known. If you have a good house, you want to ventilate, but you don't want to lose heat, especially in Mongolia. What you need is a thing called air-to-air -air heat exchange. It's a box of about 50 rooms inside, like this. Very thin rooms. And they are like this, they're spaced. Half of the rooms, air from inside the house goes out. That's warm air. It goes out. And the other 24 rooms, <laughs> I lost count exactly, air from outside comes in. And this air doesn't touch. These rooms are, there's aluminum foil in between these rooms. But the rooms are only four millimeter fat. So the air which comes in is cold, the air that goes out is warm. But as the air, outgoing air warms up the aluminum wall between these two rooms, the incoming air gets heated and the outgoing air cools down. There's two ventilators pulling air out. We are losing at the moment about two or three degrees of heat. It depends a bit on the outside temperature, but inside we are like 15 and outside we are minus 15 and then we have three degrees difference between the incoming and the outcoming air and we are replacing one cubic meter of air per minute so we do 60 uh, cubic meter per hour which is roughly the room it is easy to do oneself in two days and for about 40 dollars if you want to uh, save energy that is really the best way to ventilate in addition to air heating, the heating of water is also a very important item in energy costs in a house. A simple and effective way is to use this type of solar water heater, quite common. The water passes through pipes, is heated by the sun and is stored in a tank. But in Brazil, we met someone who decided to build his own solar water heater, which is very easy to make. We are in Rio de Janeiro, a city which benefits from a lot of sunshine throughout the year. Hans, a German living in Brazil, took the opportunity to build and install a low-tech water heater. So I will show you how we make the low-cost solar collectors. They are made from PVC plates, usually used in ceilings. Yeah, we have exactly this size, 128 for 62 centimeters. And then we paint them black. There. The plates are, are white originally. There's some styropore here down under to 
make some protection and uh, insulation. Here we see the raw material as well. It's hollow inside and a lot of channels where the water can pass by. So we take one of these plates, we take the tubes, cut them out in the same size of the plates, fit them in. You have to take a, a waterproof resin like, like for uh, surf boards because some glues they, they lose their adherence in, in a short time with the solar radiation and, and then the water. For the whole system you need a reservoir with water. You make some insulation so you can keep the water warm inside the reservoir. And one tube from the bottom of the reservoir takes cold water to the collector. Then here the collector is full of water. The water heats up with the sun. As it gets warm, it gets uh, less dense and it will come up automatically back to the uh, reservoir. The most important thing is that the reservoir has to be higher up than the collector. We did a test with a miniature demonstration system. With one litre of water and a panel of 20 to 30 centimetres, we went from 24 to 32 degrees in about 10 minutes. A plate warms on average 100 litres of water per day to a temperature of about 62 degrees Celsius. This 500 litre tank supplies the kitchen, the bathroom and the pool. I made them 16 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it still works. Still works, yes. A panel can be made very easily and from basic materials for only 10 euros. We also discovered more sophisticated systems, like here in Costa Rica, where, on the same principle, the water passes into pipes heated by the sun and is circulated by convection. However, this type of water heater is much more expensive to manufacture and isn't necessarily more effective. We go back to Joel Meadows, who chose rocket ovens as a heating system. Rocket ovens are very energy efficient wood ovens, which we'll see the principle. What's happening with a, the with a rocket stove is we're, um, we're, we're feeding sticks in here, we're lighting the fire, and the, as you'll see, the flames will go down, and it will then rise up this chimney. And this is a fully insulated um, unit, which means that most of the heat that is being generated in here will be thrown back at the fire so it makes the burn really hot and that actually nearly completely combusts the 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 wood and the smoke that comes out of the wood which means that after a few seconds you'll see that there's no smoke coming out of this and it's really just hot gases which means that we're getting as much out of the wood as we as we possibly can it's burning through it reasonably quickly, so you do need to tend them. They need to be need to be fed. These outside ovens are used only for cooking, but an oven inside also enables water heating and air heating for the house. Yes, yeah, so this is our this is our um, rocket stove booster. Wood goes in here, burns down up here. So this whole unit is insulated again. Um, and then it comes up into this bit. This is a, a copper heat exchanger. So the, there's a central flue that runs into the middle of it. And then the heat exchanger um, directs the, the hot gases down and then around the outside. And the whole heat exchanger is flooded with water. And the whole thing has got, it's got a pipe connecting into the, the bottom of it, which is our cold water coming in from the bottom of the tank. So this pipe is connected to the bottom of the hot water tank up in the tower. So what, what I usually do is I'll, I will fire it up at the same time I'm cooking my tea. We can grow the wood that we need on site because we only need a tiny bit of it because we're not using it very much and we only need a tiny bit of it because we're burning it really cleanly as well. This oven is started when the solar water heater isn't sufficient, for instance in winter, and is used to warm the air in the room. It is only used a dozen times a year and is the only heating system in the house. Bon Let's stay focused on cooking, but this time using the sun. We have seen many types of solar cookers in India and Costa Rica. They are divided into two categories, greenhouse powered solar ovens and concentrators, which are made up of a multitude of mirrors that will focus the sun's rays into one point. 
In Costa Rica, we were welcomed by the Solar Cooking Association, Sol de Vida, during the winter solstice celebration. For this occasion, they prepared a meal cooked only by the means of their numerous ovens and solar concentrators. First, let's discover how solar ovens work. For this, we have an appointment in Heredia, near San Jose, with Dr. Cheyenne, a professor specialized in solar ovens, who has done a lot of research on the subject. You can see here, there are many types of solar cookers, but the, the basic of all these solar cookers is the same. It's like a greenhouse effect. In all these cookers, there is one metallic plate, painted black. It absorbs almost, most 95% of solar radiation the black color, and that is converted into heat. Then the plate becomes hot. But at the same time, if I just keep the plate, it starts re-radiating and getting cool. To avoid that, we make a box with the heat insulation on the four side and the bottom of the plate. But on the top, to reduce that, we use one or two glasses. Still to increase the more solar radiation we use a reflector the sun rays they change their angle due to rotation of the earth to that that's why we can change the angle of the reflector at different angles depending on the time of the day plate temperature can go up to 140 150 degrees centigrade and to cook the food this is one of the cooking box type it should be metallic okay painted again black and this we can keep in the box, okay? And it's cooking slowly, keeping the nutritious value inside the food. You can use for cooking, for roasting, for baking. You can, you can make cake, you can bake bread, but you cannot fry. But frying is a different model we call the concentrator. And the food can be cooked two to four hours, okay? I mean, you can start at nine o'clock, you can start at 10 o'clock, depending on the quantity of food, depending on the solar radiation. Thanks to Dr. Shyam, numerous solar ovens have been installed in schools in the area. Nosotros desde hace aproximadamente unos 10, 12 años, aproximadamente utilizamos un sistema de calentamiento de la comida de nuestros estudiantes a través de los hornos solares. Todos los días por la mañana nuestras conserjes recogen los almuerzos en cada una de las aulas en canastas y al ser aproximadamente a las 8 de la mañana los depositan en los hornos solares. Esto va entre dos horas, dos horas y media aproximadamente, ¿verdad? Y después de ese periodo eh, lo que eh, hacen las conserjes es eh, avisarles a los estudiantes para que ellos puedan recogerlas. These ovens are very simple to build yourself. In Costa Rica, with an average usage of seven months a year, it is estimated that a family of four saves around 1,000 kilowatt hours per year. Another type of solar cooking uses solar concentrators. We have seen many different models in India, each having its own characteristics. Tous basés sur le même principe, un ensemble de miroirs qui concentre la lumière en un point précis grâce à une forme parabolique. The most common system is this one, about four square meters wide with a parabolic shape which concentrates the sun's rays onto a much smaller surface where it's possible to put a pan. How long does it take more or less to boil? For the 45 water? minutes to cook uh, 5 kg of rice. It is as if a big magnifying glass of 2 meters in diameter is put above the pan. The shape of the dish should be carefully made and the mirror is sufficiently small or curved so that the rays on the surface of the dish are reflected into the pan and that the system is effective. In the ideal case, the parabola of this farm in southern India produces about 2 kilowatts. But this system has a few drawbacks. Cook cooking area is very high yeah. and people are really short and they can't just, you know, they, they risk dropping. Yeah, it's not convenient. So they move on to this orientation. With a double reflection principle, the system is more effective and easy to use. In this case, the 360 mirrors focus the light onto a second reflector which will then reflect it up. From inside the building, the system looks like a real cooker, which can reach up to 200 degrees. Yes, and cook rice and everything. This avoids the risk of burns and glare. In any case, since the sun is moving in the sky, the orientation has to be adjusted regularly, every 10 to 15 minutes. Otherwise, the dish does not concentrate the rays exactly on the pan and the system loses its effectiveness. 
One can adjust either manually or with an automatic system. Here on the same principle as a mechanical pendulum. Tension is caused due to the strength mm -hmm. and you adjust it once and then it keeps tracking automatically. But to see a larger system, we must go to Oroville in India. Près de Pondicherry, une cité fondée en 68. Here, on the roof of a restaurant, a 15 meter wide solar bowl can reach up to 63 kilowatts, which means that it can produce 83 kilograms of vapor per hour, immediately used to cook the 1,000 meals served daily. The 11,000 mirrors of the bowl have been positioned using a laser for maximum effectiveness. On the other hand, you can also build your own solar cooker to replace your barbecue in summer. This amazing solar cooker which is handmade and also homemade and it's easy for anybody to do this in their home because watching TV is not so good like cooking food and this is an old TV dish here which is upcycled to become a solar cooker. You can just break the mirrors by yourself and glue it in and the curve is correct for the focus to be here so you can put some something to cook here and it gets hot. With a small system like this, you can boil water in bright sunshine. Nevertheless, it requires a very sunny and clear day to be able to use these techniques of solar cooking. In Europe, it's only possible in summer. We now know how to cook our food in a low-tech way, but we will see that we can also keep it cool, in a kind of fridge working without electricity. It is still in India that it can be found, in this small shop in Bangalore. This refrigerator is entirely made of clay. It has two compartments. The one below is used to keep food, and the one above is filled with about 10 litres of water. The porous clay will absorb the water from the tank. The evaporation of the water contained in the walls will cool the inside of the fridge, in the same way that the perspiration on skin cools the body. In dry and windy weather, the indoor temperature can be up to 15 degrees lower than the outdoor temperature. And you can keep your uh, fruits and vegetables naturally fresh for 5 days. In a more basic way, you can simply leave water in clay pots in the open air. Here at Barefoot College, in this dry and windy region of Rajasthan, the water in the jars will stay cool. Let's carry on in the theme of cooking and discover how to produce our own cooking gas in our own back garden. In the countryside of Karnataka, in southern India, people live mainly from silk production. Generally, each family also owns two or three cows. An organisation named SKG Singer decided to help residents extract gas from cow dung for the use in cooking. In this buried tank, a mixture of dung and water is added daily about twice as much water is done. Inside the tank, the mixture will ferment in an anaerobic environment. The fermentation process takes about a month. The gas released rises to the top of the tank and can be recovered from a pipe that will then convey it to the stove in the house. The gas, composed of 60% methane and 40% CO2, is used directly for cooking. A family of four with two cows produces enough gas to meet their needs. The pressure gradually brings out the mixture of the tank, which can then be used as compost. If the pressure in the tank comes up, the gas will simply come out, hence the small bubbles that can be seen at the exit. The manufacture of a system takes only three to five days. At first, a hole is dug. The concrete structure is then made using a mold, which makes it possible to build a tank three and a half meters in diameter. The rest of the structure is added, as well as the pipe for the gas. The hole is then backfilled, which partially buries the structure. So the family uh, spends on uh, two things. So they spend on sand, which uh, would cost them about 3,000 rupees. And the labour uh, is required for uh, three days. So that would cost them a total of 2,500, which means that they will need to spend anywhere between 5,000 or 5,500. The project is partially subsidised by the software company Infosys, which explains that the family only spend about 70 euros for construction. However, it's important that the family is the initiator of the project installation and participates financially so that they really have to invest in it. Since 2016, 2,500 families in southern India 
have seen this type of biodigester installed in their house. There are different types of biodigesters, but all operate in the same principle. In Mexico, for example, in the Yucatan countryside, we have found this biodigester, formed from a large plastic pocket. It has the advantage of being able to stretch and relax depending on the pressure and the amount of excrement inside. The family of four who uses it fills it daily with the excrement of the 20 pigs that they raise. Pig excrement would be more effective than cow dung in producing gas. Here too, the mixture that emerges at the end of the biodigester is used as fertilizer. A biodigester can be used with the excrement of just about any animal, even with humans. Here in Brazil, the different houses of the Pindorama Center are connected to this biodigester. So the human manure goes under there? A little bit of cow dung has been added at the beginning, since it contains bacteria necessary for fermentation that is not found in humans. This small village of India decided to connect its toilets of all of its inhabitants to a large biodigester below. It was under construction when we were here, case to follow. In any case, one must be aware that fermentation in anaerobic environment is conducive to the development of bacteria. It is therefore necessary to take the precaution to avoid putting the biodigester too close to the house. And even without biodigesters, one can still take advantage of the toilet by having dry toilets, for example. So we, rather than flushing with water, we flush it with sawdust. Once the tank is filled with a mixture of sawdust and excrement, it is then perfect fertilizer. Saving water and keeping the nutrient on site just felt completely, it made perfect sense. And urine can even be separated with this type of toilet. Very ingenious. Big hole is from solid, the other one is from liquids. For the recovery and treatment of grey water, even a filtration technique with plants can be used. Water from showers comes first into settling tanks. Then the water goes into a basin containing sand and gravel, which acts as a physical filter, as well as plants, which will then play the role of chemical filters capturing nutrients. At the outlet, the water can be used to water the garden, for example. One must choose plants that love water and that have a rapid growth rate, like these here bamboo. One can also choose more specific plants. The first plant you can see there is a hyacinth, water hyacinth, which is a highly nitrifying plant, which takes up the nitrogen and ammonia from the water and convert it into protein. And the second plant, I don't know the name, that absorbs phosphates, so that is more. So the soap compounds of the water and it absorbs it. This also, this is a swamp cactus that is also eating phosphates. So this is how we convert that grey water which was not directly potable to somewhat uh, potable water. There remains one last thing to study before having a real independent lifestyle. Food. Another feature of off-grid living is to try as much as possible to produce one's own food, ideally using permaculture. Let's go to Goa in India to meet Clea Chenma, a specialist on the subject who teaches permaculture to farmers and tries to spread the practice. Permaculture cannot be reduced to organic farming, as can often be heard. The idea is rather to optimise the interaction between all elements that surround us, such as food, housing, electricity, etc. You have to design it such that one becomes a resource for another. You must think of multiple functions for everything you do. For example, example the pineapple on my farm. Mm -hmm. The pineapple has fibrous roots. It has the ability to grow in the sun and the shade and in shade. It, it is, it's got pokey, it's got sharp leaves. So now keeping those in mind, what I have done to prevent uh, erosion on slopes, I grow pineapple. Then you have spaces under trees which are not utilized. You can utilize those spaces using pineapple. And the third interesting function is that I have tiger and leopard here at night. Now they will not be able to walk through a pineapple. So I pack every every bit around my house with pineapples on the slope, under a tree, under the trees. And of course, fourth advantage, it produces pineapples. Unlike monoculture, permaculture aims to maximize the symbiosis between the different plants that share the same environment, which will create a small ecosystem. In Maharashtra, they were getting an insect at night, infecting the oranges. So we put a plant which we call Ratki Rani. It produces a fragrance at night. Mm -hmm. Flowers open at night. 
So when these flowers opened at night and produced a fragrance, the insect couldn't smell the orange and the level of infection dropped considerably. So how you choose to pair plants is very important. And even without gardens, it is still possible to grow fruit and vegetables at home. This is what we saw in the Earthship in Australia, where tomatoes, bananas and other plants grow inside. Between two buildings in Bogota, Fonsena also perfectly illustrates this idea. The centre has a huge green wall of four floors, which will grow all kinds of fruits and vegetables. Our house have a lot of techniques to reduce our emissions of CO2. For example, we work with uh, green walls on how to can use the walls to produce not just oxygen and produce other things like fruits. Let's go, uh, guys. These green walls uh, are used to urban agriculture that we try to introduce this kind of ethics and habits uh, in the middle of the city. We can reach uh, a lot of uh, benefits seeding and harvesting our food in houses. First of all, you can uh, save money. Secondly, uh, you can save energy because if you plant your food in your house, uh, you can save CO2 uh, besides produce oxygen. The third benefit uh, generates a lot of satisfaction, a lot of happy to know that you are growing you, your yourself, your yeah. food, and you are gaining autonomy, independence, and you can generate another kind of economies, circular economies, and gaining spaces in, in areas where uh, before people doesn't know, don't know how to produce food. One of the most important things is the uh, use of natural light. Like the structure, like a dome, that have a lot of benefits to catch the sunlight and transmit to other places. In this case, uh, we don't need artificial light. The structure of the green wall is very simple. It is wooden panels covered with tissue, in which pockets are sewn, which serve as planters. The insides are sealed using plastic as a liner. We've seen a lot of little tricks that can save on several items of energy expenditure in the house. And by combining everything, one can even manage to have an independent home. We encountered a lot of individual projects, but we noticed that it can also be interesting to have community projects, for example, with your neighbours, like Dr. Modak, inhabitant of Pune, did. I decided to take confidence of my neighbours and the people around me to convince them how to become independent. Self-sufficient electricity, thanks to solar panels, he tries to convince his neighbours to do the same, in order to create a micro-network at the scale of a few houses to produce electricity from solar energy. In a less personal way, we found in Melbourne, companies financing collaborative solar projects. To prevent the cost of installing solar panels from being an obstacle for families and SMEs, the agencies Corona Funds and Moreland Community offer to install them for free. Recipients reimburse the project by purchasing electricity each month from the organisation that financed it, rather than from the electricity supplier, as if the project were a loan and that they are paying back. Once the system has been fully repaid, it belongs to the beneficiary, and the money can be reinvested by the organisation into other projects, a good way to promote solar. So for example, if, if, if it's a... Um, if it's a 99 kilowatt system, and it costs $150,000 to install it, then um, we charge them rent for seven years or five years or 10 years until we get all that money back. Okay, and then it's for them. Like, and then, and then, the we gift, the, then we gift it to them, or we, we, we sell it to them for $1. Some people decide to settle in communities, to form eco-villages or eco-communities that share the same values in terms of lifestyle and sustainable development. We head to Auroville. This idealistic city was created to bring together people from around the world, focused on a philosophy of meditation and nature. It is divided into independent sub-communities. One of them is the community of Sadhara Forest, 
which aims to reforest the region, while having a way of life in perfect harmony with its environment. Totally self-contained, homes are made of wood or bamboo, solar panels provide electricity, and bicycles take over in bad weather. Vegetables are grown on site, but the inhabitants are mainly volunteers, who stay there for a period of up to six months. It's not a community where people stay long term. To discover an actual eco-village, let's head north to Siberia, to Ladaga village. Created 15 years ago by 22 volunteer families, the inhabitants all follow the same ideology. The houses, not connected to electricity grid, are built of wood by the inhabitants themselves. They produce most of their own food and the practice of exchange of goods between them. The water must be drawn from the well. Although a little bit extreme, this type of village presents an example of a community living in an ecological way. When you get home, maybe you'll see your house a bit differently. And while you're at it, why not start a low-tech installation of your own? It's your turn.